This is the podcast for the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. I'm Cynthia Graber. Driving while under the influence of THC, known as drugged driving, is becoming more of an issue as more states legalize cannabis for both medical and recreational use around the country. THC is known to impair cognitive and psychomotor performance and thus impair driving. So there are companies working to, to develop um, THC breathalyzers, and there's a major issue with THC breathalyzers. And the issue is that THC exposure does not equal THC impairment. Jody Gilman is a neuroscientist and an associate professor of psychiatry at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School, and she's one of the authors of a new study in the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. She says that impairment and exposure are easier to correlate with alcohol, but tolerance to THC is so vastly different among different people, and the amounts that people use, whether for pain or to get high, are also so vastly different that people can have detectable amounts of THC in their system but it does not necessarily correlate with whether or not that person is too impaired to drive. Eden Evans is the Cox Family Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and the founding director of the Mass General Center for Addiction Medicine and is another of the authors of the study. Our goal was to get a better tool, if possible, to detect impairment. More people are, are using and driving, more people are, are have cannabis available to them, and many people say that they use cannabis and drive. And we really thought that when you're impaired, your brain should reflect that. So what did you do to try to detect brain impairment under the influence of THC? So we used this um, technique called FNIRS, Functional Near Infrared Spectroscopy, um, which is a cap that you can put on on somebody's head. And it's quite safe. It's non-invasive. It's used in babies. um, And it basically uses light to measure changes in blood flow in the brain. And we wanted to see if we could use this technique to develop some sort of neural signature of impairment to see if the brain looked different when it was impaired and people got THC versus when people got THC and they were not impaired. Because a lot of people in the study got THC but did not exhibit signs of of impairment. And a THC breathalyzer or a device like that would not distinguish between somebody who was exposed to THC versus somebody who was impaired from THC. Today, specialized police officers called drug recognition experts are called in if someone is suspected of drug driving, but their expanded field sobriety test has a very high false positive rate and is quite subjective. So in your study, how did you define impairment in the brain from THC and then relate it to road safety? Our initial plan was to, was to use the drug recognition experts using the expanded field sobriety test as the gold standard measure of impairment. And our goal was to to look at before and after THC and see if in in group measures, do we see a change in brain function and in prefrontal cortical function? And could we use a single measurement during impairment uh, with a machine learning algorithm to do better on a case by case basis of identifying individuals who were impaired compared to the drug recognition experts? Unfortunately, the drug recognition experts had such a high um, rate of calling people impaired after receiving placebo um, that we needed to construct a second measure, essentially, of impairment. And we did that by essentially two ways. One, we used just numerical values of people's self-reported intoxication together with their change in heart rate to identify people who were likely impaired. And the second one was essentially consensus ratings by Jody and myself. We independently rated whether or not we thought people were at least 75% likely of being impaired based on the dose of drug that they got, their self-reported impairment, their performance on a driving simulator task when that was available, their performance on a cognitive task, the impact task when available, and both the drug recognition experts uh, rating, as well as the nurses rating and the, the research assistants rating, which was essentially a single rating of, you know, would you get in the car with this person driving right now? And so in the end, the uh, ground truth that we used for the, for the classifier um, was uh, people who who were rated impaired by Jody and myself independently and that were above a threshold on the algorithmic method, just using the numeric values of heart rate and self-reported impairment on the DEQ. So it was involved because we really couldn't use the drug recognition expert. The idea was we wanted to be really sure. So some of these people received THC and reported that they were a little bit high, right? So we said, how high do you feel on a scale of one to 100? And some people would say a 20 or a 30. Um, But if we were not certain that they were too impaired to drive, we didn't want to classify them as impaired. 
because we thought that for our method to be useful, it had to really not detect false positives. We wanted to get our false positive rate as low as possible. So that's why Eden mentioned that we wanted to be 75% confident that this person was impaired. So you had 169 adults age 18 to 55 who report regular use of cannabis, and you did a double-blind crossover study where at times they received THC and at times a placebo, and you subjected them to what you just described, self-evaluations and cognitive tests and driving simulators. What did you find? So the first step of this study was to separate impaired people from non-impaired people. So we, we looked at the group data and we found that the people who were impaired had greater, um, it's what's called HBO concentration throughout the prefrontal cortex. But I think what was really unique about this paper and really important is that we then took that data and we put it in our machine learning classifier. So we fed the machine learning classifier FNIR's data alone, so um, just the brain data, and it could predict whether or not that person was impaired or not, whether it matched the ground truth impairment, which we talked about before, which was um, the clinical rating and the computer rating of heart rate and self-reported intoxication. And what we found was that the machine learning classifier identified in an individual, in any given participant, whether they were impaired with 76.4% accuracy and with a false positive rate of just about 10%. Now that needs to be improved. We were quite pleased with the performance. It's better than anything else that we've tried. And it was better than the field sobriety test, which was about a 35% false positive rate. Um, But we do want to get that down. And and, um, we think that with more data collection and a greater number of participants, we can get that down. But what was really exciting to us and what we thought was quite innovative about this study was that we could get at that individual prediction. And so does this mean that police officers in the future will be traveling around with this little kind of skull cap FNIR system to look at markers in the brain that demonstrate THC impairment, not just THC exposure? More work needs to be done, of course. This isn't ready for prime time just yet, but that would be sort of the end goal of this project so that someday police officers could have a tool that could actually detect impairment from the brain. And it could be portable and wireless and easy to use and inexpensive and non-invasive. It would be accurate and fair. There's lots of details that will have to be worked out. It will have to become more accurate, in my opinion, with a lower false positive rate. But we we got, I think, excellent results with very few subjects, very few participants. So we double our sample size. We'll improve our ability to to detect um, and. Then the, the, the operating procedures will need to be worked out, you know, how it's deployed, whether it's with a breathalyzer, whether it's with a cognitive task. But I, I'm really optimistic that this is a novel and useful tool that's now possible. What are the challenges or the limitations to this kind of approach? Now, this will be very inexpensive, so certainly compared to, to the labor of a drug recognition expert. The brain's complicated. And so we need to show specificity that certain brain diseases, certain drugs that are active in the brain that are medicines that aren't impairing, make sure that they don't uh, replicate the same signature as cannabis impairment. Most of this is testable, but if you think about it, there's an infinite number of sort of psychological, neurological, medication, um, all different combinations of things that can affect the brain. We don't think that these conditions will look like cannabis intoxication. We don't have any reason to think that we can't get a neural signature of cannabis intoxication specifically, but that research will need to be done. It sounds like, though, overall, this was a really exciting finding that there is a brain signature and that it could potentially be useful because the tools we have right now, a breathalyzer type test or even the drug recognition expert assessment, these just aren't working well enough. That's right. And we showed sensitivity. Now our job is to show specificity. Yeah, we agree. We think it's super exciting. We think there's definitely a path forward. You know, there's more work to be done, but it can, it can be done. This is the podcast for the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. To read the article discussed in the podcast, go to www.nature.com NPP. I'm Cynthia Graber.